to receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The other piece of that is that we hold that sacrament in very, in very high regard. And the third thing that we recognize is that people are at different places in their spiritual journey. Our communion will be our Lord's Supper, our Mass, however you know it from your background, the Eucharist, will be celebrated next Sunday on the first Sunday of the new year. And all of you are welcome to come and participate with us in this holy and meaningful time. Thank you. Lord Jesus Christ, I ask now that you come among us, walking up and down the aisles and slipping through the pews, touching our lives with your Holy Spirit. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would take these words, these thoughts, and make many your living word for us. And we know you will, for we pray with great anticipation and enormous joy in your holy name. Amen. question this morning. When was the last time you were disappointed? Maybe your repairman didn't show up when he promised he would. Or maybe your doctor in the office was running late. Or maybe an attorney didn't return the call as they, as they promised they would. Or maybe some relative lets you down horribly, your spouse or your partner or a child or, or your parent or, 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 or maybe there was some situation that disappointed you terribly when you were counting on something happening and it didn't take place. Holidays are a perfect setup for disappointment. We get this idea in our head about the way about the way Christmas should be. And we get on 95 and the traffic isn't moving. Or we go to the store and it doesn't have what we're looking for. Or the postal service doesn't deliver our package on time. And we're very, very disappointed. I mean, the holiday sets all that up. When was the last time you were disappointed? And you know, the holiday has a way of doing that. I mean, we get these images on television on the Hallmark Channel about the way Christmas is supposed to be, that everything turns out beautifully. When was the last time you were disappointed? When I lived in Dallas, there was a family there that I loved enormously. And they gave their children hockey sticks and an electric guitar for Christmas. And before the evening was out, the children were playing hockey on the driveway and knocked out every window on that side of the house. And the electric guitar shut down the entire electrical system of that house. I think that Christmas offers that kind of setup for us. Did you notice this weekend? All the advertisements in the paper for movies that were coming out. I don't know where these companies think we have time to go to the cinema, but they have all these movies coming out, and the headlines say, the best movie of the year, definitely an Academy Award contender, you know, all those advertisements to try to lure us into those movies, and then we get there, and they're terribly, terribly disappointing, those those hype situations. Some years ago, two doctors were working at Washington State University, and they were forming this scale of stressful events that one has to live in, in, in their lives. And they sort of ranked them, giving 100 points down to one or two points. The highest ranking, of course, was the, was the death of a spouse or, or a child. And they would assign that, that was a hundred point stress. And they would give these, these, these things, these stress, the death of a sibling, the divorce, unemployment, moving, even if it's for a good reason and you're getting a promotion, it can still
still be a very, very disturbing fact, a stress-inducing time. And if you think you're stressed, you ought to come to Dr. Sales' class this next week, okay? Because he's going to be talking about those kinds of issues, all right? I gave you a free plug there, okay? <laughs> next Sunday morning at 9.30 in the Christian Education Room. But if they gave these assignments to all these stress-inducing moments in life, and even Christmas, even Christmas was on that, was on that list. But before we can get there to that kind of healing that we need from those disappointments, there's a lot to be done even now with the leftovers of Christmas. The tree and the decoration has to be put out on the street. The ornaments have to be boxed away for next year and put in the attic. The thank you notes have to be written. Then there's all that food. What do we do with all that chocolate? <laughs> and the cookies? And the fruitcake? Do we eat it all and put on 10 or 15 pounds? Or do we pass it along to someone else and let them put on 10 or 15 pounds? Then there are the other kinds of leftovers. There's the turkey. What do we do with it? Do we make soup? Do we make sandwiches? Do we make a casserole? Do we freeze it? Do we make soup? What do we do with that? And then there's the leftover wrappings and the ribbons and, the, and all those things that go, with, that go with Christmas and all those things that are, that are left over. On this Sunday, the last Sunday of 2018. Jesus wants us to know that Christmas is more than merely a nostalgia time. For some of us, Christmas is over too soon. We wish we had just a few more hours with someone we love. We had just a bit more time. And then for others of us, we're so glad that Christmas, I heard somebody this week say, I am so glad that Christmas is over. Some people I know didn't have such a, a grand Christmas, and some of them are even here this morning. Some are very glad to see it over and ended. Some people I know would have rather skipped Christmas all, all together and just move ahead to the, to the near, new year. I'm here to tell you that on this last Sunday of 2018, in preparation for the Lord's Supper next Sunday, Jesus understands, Jesus Christ understands every one of those disappointments, every disappointing situation. And on this last Sunday of 2018, God offers an invitation but I hope you'll RSVP for a deeper, more personal relationship with God through Christ. Oscar Wilde will find that there are two great disappointments in the world. One, not getting what you want. And number two, is getting it. The reason for that, I think, is rather simple. Have you ever gotten something, maybe something that you really, really wanted? And you thought, man, this is the best it's going to get. And then after you got it, you began to look around and you thought, well, maybe I like that thing better over there. Maybe that would make me happy, and so we go after that, and we live in this culture that encourages us always to be in the search of the, of the next thing, thinking that that's going to be the better thing. Love our scripture lesson this morning. I wish we had time to read that whole seventh chapter of John, because it's an important and moving and moving chapter. And it's applicable, I think, on this particular, on this particular Sunday. Picture the scene. It's the festival of the tabernacles. 
Now, the festival of the tabernacles was one of the three great festivals in the Jewish tradition. The one, one of the three in which all Jewish males living within a hundred mile radius were expected to come to Jerusalem to celebrate its observance. One was the Passover, the second was Pentecost, and the third was the Feast of Tabernacles. Those other two occurred in the spring when the planting was going on in that agrarian culture. But this festival of the Tabernacles was kind of a celebration of Thanksgiving and it usually took place on or around our month of October, on the 15th day. And it was an eight-day celebration in which people would come together and they would eat and they would drink and they would dance and they would party and they would have a wonderful time. And the festival of the tabernacles had both an agrarian significance and a, and a, and a, and a spiritual, historical significance as well. Historically speaking, it was a reminder of the 40 years that the children of Israel spent wandering in the wilderness before coming into the promised land. And they would, and God, God provided for them, even though they didn't have a, they had no food, God would provide food, even though they didn't have a place to stay, God would provide them with places to stay, and they would build these little, they would build these little tents, or these little shacks, or these little tabernacles, if you will. Thus it's its name. And in fact, observant Jews to this day, if you drive through Orthodox neighborhoods, you will still see in the backyard, around the middle of October, these little tents that are put up as a reminder that they had spent 40 years in the wilderness. Now the agrarian significance of that was quite obvious because in the spring, Pentecost and Passover, they would do their planting. In October, they would do their harvesting and they would bring in the barley and the wheat and the olives and the, and the grapes and all those things would be gathered in. Now, when the brothers of Jesus, is a bit of background to what Fran read so beautifully this morning, when the, when the brothers of Jesus saw that the Feast of Tabernacles were coming, they were urging Jesus to go down, go down to Jerusalem and they told him, you know, Jesus, if you go down there, you've been performing all these miracles up here in Galilee. You need to go down to Jerusalem because that would be a, a prime place for you to do some of your miracles and would help your would help your career. Have you ever had anyone whisper in your ear, this is what you should do? Have you ever had anyone whisper out of your ear, this is what you should do? Well, Jesus had his brothers telling him, this is what you need to do what you should be doing. Probably, truth be told, they wanted to go to the party too. And since he was the older brother, they wouldn't be going to the party without him. And there is that one verse which I find so haunting in chapter 7. It says, even his brothers, even his brothers, did not believe. They were wondering, like everyone else, if you read the verses just prior to our scripture lesson this morning, they were wondering too, is he really the Messiah? I mean, we grew up with this guy. We know him. Is it possible that he is the Messiah? But they wanted him to go to Jerusalem on the first day of the festival. And Jesus makes an interesting response to them. He says, your time is always here. But my time has not yet come. What do you mean by that? The Greek word that's used there in the New Testament for their time is chronos, the Greek word. Meaning, uh, it's the word from which we get our chronology. It's the word from which we get chronological. It is a measured, structured time. Jesus wasn't thinking of chronos. He was thinking instead, when he said, my time has not yet come, he was thinking of the Greek word, keros. Keros is that moment. Have you ever had a time in your life when it seemed like nothing was working? When it seemed like you kept running into dead ends? When nothing would open to you and then suddenly a 
door open. That is a that is a Kairos moment. And then when you walk through that door, that is a Kairos moment. And so Jesus said, your time is about chronology, about doing things in a measured way. My time is a right time. A moment when the door will open for me and I will have an opportunity to walk through that. Moment of opportunity. Jesus told his brothers, You want me to go down to Jerusalem now? This isn't the right time. But I'll go when the time is right. So Jesus delays his arrival until the last day of the festival of the tabernacles. And this was the most important day. This was absolutely the most important day. They would have eight candles in the temple, and each day, much like Hanukkah, they would light another candle. And so all eight candles were lit. And on the eighth day, the priest would go down to the go down to the go down to Salome, the the the, the, uh, the fountain there, and would get about a two quart pitcher full of water. And very, very importantly, the priest would come and pour out the water on the altar. As a, uh, as a symbol of pouring out life to God's grace. So at that moment, when the candles are beginning to flicker and go out one by one, and after the priest has poured the water, Jesus then appears, and he says the most interesting thing about himself. As the water is dripped, candles are stopped, Jesus makes his assertion, his presence known. And as the people were experiencing the leftovers of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus appears. And he makes this interesting statement. He says, I am the light of the world, as the candles were. Anyone who follows me will not walk in darkness, for they will have the light of life. And it was in this context of this great celebration, Jesus proclaimed one of his great, one of his great I am statements, I am the light, and my light will burn brightly forever. Then the bold question, the people have witnessed all of these symbolic gestures, this, this, this candle lighting and the pouring out of of water as a spiritual symbol for pouring out their lives. The party was coming to an end. They danced all night and things were beginning to, to wind down and Jesus makes his assertion. And then he says, is anyone here still thirsty? Dancing and partying and the food and the drinking didn't satisfy their needs. So he asked the question, is anyone here still thirsty? You know the emptiness that follows the party? The emptiness that sometimes follows Christmas. And Jesus says, if you want the ultimate light, if you want your thirst quenched, if you want your hunger assuaged, then come with me. I am the Messiah. The whole proclamation. 2019. God has a word for us. The word is don't give up. Don't give God the leftovers. The leftovers of your energy, the leftovers of your time, the leftovers of your money, the leftovers of your creativity. You know, we tend to do that in the church of Jesus. Christ, don't we? I mean, we give our energies to all kinds of very, very important things, to our career, to our family, to our to our home, to, to the neighborhood, to the to civic groups. We give all of our energy out there, and those things are all good. But then what happens is because we've lived so much of our life out there, we give God what's 
what's left over. The Gallup people, George Gallup did a, did a survey in which he talked about, he asked people questions about their religious faith, and come to find out, 96% responded favorably, positively, to their belief in God. 90% say that they pray regularly. 90% say they have a Bible. The Bible is still the number one seller in America. But I wonder how many people read the Bible because only 50% could of the people interviewed could name the four Gospels. Fewer than 50% could name five of the Ten Commandments. Fewer than 60% of Christians said that they believed in the resurrection. Wow. Really? So on the Sunday of 2018, what does it mean for us not to give God the leftovers of our life and our energy and our time and our money and our creativity? As good as those other things are, God doesn't want the leftovers of our life. But if we believe in our heart, then it follows that we can hold nothing back from God. And when we do that, when we put God number one in our life, Everything else falls into its proper place. Our family, our career, our job, our, all of that falls into its rightful place. But first, we put God at the center of our lives. A man I know was working on his computer one night, and he had a report that he had to get in the next morning. And this little girl came into the room, and he, she said to him, Daddy, Mom said if I come in here, you'd give me a hug. So he gave her a hug and a kiss and said, okay, sweetheart, go off to bed now. Went back to work on his computer. Report was due the next morning. In a few moments, he started because the little girl is still waiting there. And he said, sweetheart, what do you want? And she said, Mom told me that you'd give me a kiss and a hug. And he said, I gave you a kiss and a hug. Now go on your way. And she said, she has to the work in it. Are we going to give God the left? 